Hey students. Well, here we are again making another video. And this video is for the EDUC 2400 students and anyone else who might be interested. Um, we are focusing on school society and social differences. Um, and we are a, um, working on understanding how schools and society are connected and how does um, social difference influence that. Historically, it hasn't been a good relationship and um, patterns of excluding learners and whole communities have been based on these social differences. So um, today, um, I would like to focus on um, another principle from our Enduring Principles of Learning. So let me just share my screen with you for a moment. Um, okay. All right. So I'll move this over here. So hopefully you don't have so much to look at. Okay, so um, we talked about uh, principle eight being student-directed activity, that students have to have choices in um, their learning. We want them to be independent learners, and by giving them opportunities to make choices and um, be self-directed that um, helps foster increased learning and positive experiences in the classroom. And really they're much more invested in the classroom too. So today um, I wanna to focus on principle six, okay? Principle six, critical stance. Now this is the one that um, Dr. Mohammed calls criticality. And Dr. Ladson Billings calls um, sociopolitical awareness. And sociopolitical awareness is kind of a mouthful and it's kind of hard to wrap your head around it. So I, I really prefer um, Dr. Mohammed's uh, term criticality. Um, because it's deeper than critical thinking. Um, critical thinking is part of it, but it's not enough. And this is often the one that teachers struggle with the most. Um, because this is the one that um, really makes a difference in difference. Um, do you remember how we talked about how Ladson Billings talked about you had to have high levels of academic achievement, high levels of cultural competence from teacher and student. They both have to be able to walk in two and more worlds. Um, they can be Latinx and successful in school. They don't have to leave their identity and their personal and community gifts at the door of the classroom like the Butterflies Girl um, she did. And Matthew had to until Mr. Frank figured out how to be a dream keeper. So um, this last one is Ladson Billings' um, sociopolitical awareness or Dr. Muhammad's uh, criticality. And it just means that you're looking at issues of inequity, okay? And the hard part for most teachers is that they were not taught in this way. So teaching is often a lot like parenting. We parent like our parents parented us, often if we're not very intentional about that and we just reproduce it. Um, teaching is the same where um, you've spent a lot of time in the student's desk and observing what teachers do. And so oftentimes we just teach the way that we were taught. And that doesn't work for everybody. And our leaking educational pipeline shows that it has never worked for everyone. But if we really believe that all learners should have quality um, education, they should have access to excellent learning opportunities and experiences and outcomes, then that means that we have to interrupt that educational pipeline, which has been leaking since its beginning. So how do we handle this um, uh, principle six critical stance? 
Okay, it says teaching to transform inequities. Empower students to transform society's inequities through democracy and civic engagement. Okay, so in acting level, the teacher consciously engages learners in interrogating conventional wisdom and practices, reflecting on ramifications and seeking actively to transform inequities within their scope of influence in the classroom and community. Now that sounds like a lot, I know, and sometimes it seems like, well, look, I just want to be a history teacher. Um that's not for me. But if you think about it, um, well, history, uh, whole groups of people's history have been left out. And that's why we have to have Women's History Month in March. We have um, celebrating Latinx heritage um, from September 15th till October 15th. November is Native American heritage um, celebration. So we have all of these different celebrations because they were left out, right? So how does that make communities feel if their whole uh, background was left out as if they never did anything to contribute to the United States and to our world and society? Um, and it's just simply not true, right? So we don't want to be teaching falsehoods. So history is one example, but even math. Um, you know, sometimes you hear about teachers who are taking their students on trips to um, the East Coast and they go visit MIT and, you know, some of these wonderful, amazing, um, you know, STEM centered places, which is great. You think about walking in two worlds. That's wonderful. But like, for example, if you're thinking about um, Latinx students in uh, California, um, in Utah, in Arizona, in places that used to be part of Mexico, um, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which brought um, the northern part of Mexico into the United States, um, the peoples that were already here in what was the mythical Aztlan, um, that... Those were people who developed corn, the three sisters, right? Squash, corn, beans. They developed that um, immense uh, knowledge about astrology, about um, archaeology, um, about uh, architecture, about um about oral traditions and and um, calendars, you know, so there's all kinds of richness right in the ground here. You don't have to go to MIT, although that would be a great place to go and learn, um, but don't forget that there's, that uh, a lot of groups have, have uh, developed a lot of history too, but it's often just left out. So um, that reason of leaving things out is very um, important for teachers and it's often hard for them to understand. Um, uh, many of you know that I'm from Alabama. And so when I was teaching some future teachers and in-service teachers in Alabama, we have, um, in Alabama, it's about 22% African-American. And in our city of Mobile, um, this the the percentage is even higher. The city is about um, fifty five percent um, African American, about forty percent white, and then that other little um, uh, percentage is made up of. Uh, a long time uh, Asian Americans who uh, immigrated to the United States, um, you know, even before World War II. Um, you have a lot of uh, indigenous peoples, the Cree, the Chickasaws, um, uh, different nations that are still in Alabama. Um, and so you have a, a big group and a very um, fast growing uh, Latinx group. So you have this very diverse population. And so we were talking about how I went to the USS Alabama 
um, which is a ship that was a very important ship during World War II. And when I toured that ship, I didn't see any um, of the pictures on all of the levels. They had pictures all the way through. And I knew that African-Americans were um, members of the Navy and the military, but they were nowhere um, on the ship. And that was just an example. And so when I came back to my class and we were talking about the curriculum and how whole groups of students get left out of the curriculum and what a problem it is, this really brought it home. My students were so angry because it was as if they had been like if their ancestors were in lower Alabama they were maybe enslaved as chattel and um they worked the cotton fields and that's it like apparently they didn't do anything more than um the hard labor of developing um the cotton and um making the uh, planter society wealthy and and the people who were up in new england where the factories were where the cotton was processed and so making other people very wealthy so it kind of seemed like they hadn't done nothing so um my students went over to the ship and they too toured it and they were like yep we don't see any contributions of um the black community there let alone other communities like the asian community and so on and so that's very um hurtful that your your group your family people who've been there for a long time uh are just erased and so, you know, we started digging into it and come to find out there were laws in lower Alabama, just and in Alabama, as well as across the country, where you could not hang pictures of um, black people on walls in public uh, buildings and places. So there, it was very intentional about how you would erase whole groups of people and their contributions. So you have to start doing some of this digging to find out, you know, who was doing what. And for example, in Alabama, you have um, uh, uh, George Washington Carver was working there. He did all kinds of things with the um, peanut and with getting rid of the little weevil that uh, ruins the cotton crops. And you know, today, even when you go to uh, visit the area where in um, Eastern Alabama, where uh, George Washington Carver was working, Today, there is a statue of the weevil, but not George Washington Carver, who invented the way to get rid of the weevil so it wasn't destroying the cotton crops. So do you see how important it is when we look at these inequities, like whole groups of people are erased. And then when you come to the classroom and you as a teacher are presenting these materials, as if the students who are sitting there had and their communities had nothing to say or do about this area and developing it and contributing to it, it's very hurtful and harmful to them, as well as it is very dishonest, right? We It doesn't make any sense that you would present a white mainstream curriculum uh, which suggests that only the white mainstream has contributed anything. Um, that's just not only not true, it's not possible, right? So actually many groups have. And so criticality is kind of looking at that and saying, you know, what is it that we are missing in this story and why is it there? Okay, so I think I've shared with you the story of my kindergartners when we went to go to the dentist's office to visit our community helpers. And my little um, six-year-old kindergartner, a uh, little Kristen, she asked why the helpers were girls and the dentists were boys. And so she offered a very um, important lesson in criticality. Her question raised that. And so we in, were very intentional about saying, uh, going back to our classroom and talking about how, um, you know, girls can do math and science very well too, and that they could definitely be dentists. 
And um, so we were very intentional about addressing that. And that was a criticality sort of thing. So oftentimes the students themselves will bring up many of the issues if you're listening to them. Um, but I want to share with you, um, you know, what it might look like in the classroom um, as you're addressing this um Principle six, which tends to be um, something that uh, teachers often struggle with. So let me see if I can um, once again share my share a document with you. Um, this is an article that I published with my colleague a couple years ago, and it's called um, the the education and schools our children deserve okay and um this came out actually my students in alabama helped me to uh, think this through because we were having a, a conversation about criticality and one of my students said i live in and it's a county in alabama and it says we have a high school graduation rate of 98% or something like that. Sounds great, right? Sure does. Um, but very few people in our county go on to college or have bachelor's degrees. You make significantly less money if you don't graduate from college. The average income in our county is about 35 grand per year. Okay, now this is just 2012, so it wasn't like it was, you know, centuries ago. Um, the average income or the the industrial, the industry um, is a big employer in our county. They donate a lot of money to our school system. If you ask me, they are training their own reserve of ready-to-go minimum wage workers. So, I mean, that's a criticality question right there, right? What do you learn to do with your education? Um, an education to do what? That is the question that um, uh, Carter G. Woodson asked. He's the father of Black history. And um, he wrote um, uh, several very important um, uh, texts in education and particularly about Black students. So uh, he asked the question, educated to do what? To be servants? Um, a second class education? To follow directions? To um, not question things? Is that the kind of education? Okay, so um, uh, in this article here, um, what uh, there's a piece that I want to share with you that is, I think, one of the best definitions of um, what our education is trying to do and what makes the difference between an exemplary teacher and a good teacher. A good teacher is not someone who is exemplary. Exemplary means that these are the teachers who are successful with the students that other teachers continue to fail with. Okay, those really tough kids. Um, so, and this is Carter G. Woodson. He said, real education means to inspire people to live more abundantly, to learn to begin with life as they find it, Right. We aren't born into this um, very democratic, equitable um, world and nor are our classrooms that way. Right. Um, so we uh, learn to begin with life as they find it and make it better. OK, I love that definition of education. Real education means to inspire people to live more abundantly. That means like use your talents, use your skills, develop your skills. You're not just um, like one of the um, one of the impulses of education of U.S. public schools is to send you to work in the economy. Well, yes, you know, we all need to be able to um be able to participate in the economy so that we can meet our needs of food, shelter, you know, and so on. 
but we're not just workers in the economy, right? We're human beings who have families, we have talents, gifts. It's not simply about making money, although making money is important. It's not um, just making money. Does that make sense? So to live more abundantly doesn't mean that we just go to our job and then come home and then rest and go back to job. To live abundantly would be to use and develop your talents, share them with others, share your gifts with others, and look around you and make the world a better place around you. Okay, so to do that, you have to learn to begin with life as you find it. It's not a perfect life. We're born into it. Our schools, our communities, our homes, none of it's perfect, right? Um, as hard as we work to um, do our best at everything, we're human beings and we fall short regularly, right? So we have to learn to begin with life as we find it. How is it? But does it have to stay that way? Are there things that we could do to make our classroom so that every learner falls, is um, uh, is um, excelling and, and growing and developing in a positive way, that their skills and talents are being developed? So how can we do that? So I love that um, definition of an education. And that's really what, um, that is what criticality is about. Like, it's about starting with life as you find it. And then what can we do about it? So my students, when I taught elementary school, we um, had a park that was about two blocks down the street from our elementary school. And there were often um, broken beer bottles, um, wine bottles, um, and even sometimes needles that were just in the grass. And it was very dangerous for us to use that park, but it was a public place. And so my students, that was how we found the park. And that's not the way the parks were on the other side of the city. So we ask questions about like, why is our park that way? And um, so we used our literacy, um, our language arts, and we wrote letters. And um, uh, we eventually got our, um, our mayor to come and visit our school and our uh, neighborhood um, uh, organization. And they started to... Um, you know, uh, work together to have efforts to collaboratively clean up our park. The police came and talked to our school and um, they suggested what they could do. So we took the world as we found it and we used our math skills, our social studies skills, our history skills, our language arts skills to make the world a better place for our neighborhood. Does that make sense? So that was really about um, bringing academics and criticality together. Um, so that is one example that I wanted to share with you. Um, as you remember, um, uh, Dr. Muhammad, she says, Criticality is helping students to read and think and write in active ways as opposed to passive. So as students, we often, as teachers, we groom you to be passive. Don't talk unless I unless you raise your hand and I call on you and give you a permission to talk. Don't go use the restroom unless I give you permission to go out of the room, you know, things like that. Now, I'm not advocating that kids can just talk or run out of the room or whatever, but there it isn't an either or. You can have structures in place where students are able to monitor their own emotions and monitor their own behavior and say, is this contributing to the kind of classroom where we can all be developing our skills and our knowledge and so that it sounds like, feels like, um, looks like a classroom where we are struggling to learn to, to use our learning to struggle to make the world a better place. Does that make sense? 
So um, that's where we want these independent, active learners. And criticality is about that, about being um, active, not passive. Okay, we don't want them to be passive consumers of knowledge. Be skeptical, ask questions. I don't mind um, even my adult students like ask questions. It's okay to ask questions. Okay, and look at um, what are those inequities? Remember when I said that it was about more than just um, uh, critical thinking? Yes, critical thinking is important and it's part of it. And it doesn't mean negative thinking. It looks at things like who is included, who isn't, um, why is it like that? You know, if I live in an all white neighborhood, um, why is it all white? You know, is it that um, there are uh, policies in place where that's discouraging um, families of color from moving into this neighborhood? Is it an income thing? Is it um, these uh, subtle biases? What's going on? That um, why is this like it is? And what can I do? What can I um, use my sphere of influence for to um, work with others to address this? Usually, you can't do things on your own, but. Oftentimes, if you work with others and talk about it, um, they often will have good ideas too, and you can work together. Okay, so it's about um, looking at that at those um, inequities. Okay, so um, okay, now what I want to do is give you some examples of what that looks like in the classroom. And this is a little um, a, a educator brief that I put together based on my research on exemplary uh, Black teachers. And you have exemplary teachers in all groups. I just was living in the deep South. And so I had a lot of exemplary teachers who happen to be black, but you have exemplary teachers who are white, exemplary teachers who are Latinx, exemplary teachers who are indigenous. Um, so these just happen to be um, black because that's what my research was. So um, the, the teaching and learning that they developed was called African-American Pedagogical Excellence, okay? And so basically that is dream keeping. Okay, so here is one of the um, teachers that I was honored to be able to get to know and to study her teaching. And her name is uh, Mrs. Charlie Ann Brown Hayes. And um, we just call her mama, okay? And um, so she's talking about how she interacts with her students. And this is how she approaches criticality, that principle six. Um, she says, a, a committed teacher will help students to learn the importance of education. So education is the key and um, it will unlock a lot of things. So she pushes that, um, force them to think critically. That's hard to do. So she guides them to it and models it and encourages that and it becomes a habit. So she says that's not easy because the path of least resistance is just simply um, to be passive and just because my teacher said so, um, it, that's the path of least resistance, but that's not going to foster practicing being an independent learner. So she says, I share with students my situation about my children. I share with them that because you're in public housing or you're in a crowded situation, that is not an excuse not to learn. Um, I give them examples of people in slavery, in spite of the fact that you get your hands cut, your eyes poked out, even if you got caught with a book. Remember, it used to be against the law to teach Black people how to, how to read and write. 
in spite in spite of all that they move forward to get educated and to educate themselves they learned how to read so she's like well if they could do it you know we can do it and they had it you know under a lot of duress where it's like if you get caught learning how to read right think about what happened to um frederick Douglass, right it, it was a big no-no to teach um uh, enslaved people how to read and write um so i let them know that the media is trying to convince them that they're stupid and that they can't learn and i say that's not the case um, the students know I'm pushing them. I tell them education is your key. If you don't like what you're in now, get a good education. I constantly talk to the students. I tell them you're smart. You haven't let it out yet. This is my favorite part. She says, you're like a cake. Um, if you take each ingredient separate and let it stand alone, it's not a whole lot, not fantastic, until you put it together. Isn't that beautiful? You're like a cake. I feel like my students are like cakes too. They're sweet and they have all these different ingredients that come together and then they produce something beautiful. So you're like cakes too. Um, so I tell them, you've been told by the media that that when they show a crime that's been committed, they show black blacks to make you think you're a criminal, you're dishonest, you can't learn, but that's not true. Um, so there's no sense in you playing that. So she doesn't allow for excuses. She's like, I know that these things are out here, but you have gifts and your job is to develop them no matter what the hard things are. You she acknowledges the hard things that's the criticality of it but she pushes them and she supports them encourages them and she believes in them okay so here you see um uh here's um how she approaches all of that um so here's another teacher who's talking about his teacher miss mac and miss mac was definitely about principle six that criticality he says, when I was in the 10th grade, Miss Mack was a driving force. I didn't apply myself. So he'd already kind of learned that if you just be passive, nobody has expectations of black students or minoritized students. So he kind of had internalized that and believed it. I didn't apply myself because there was no one to pull me out. She was like a dentist, just extracting a tooth. She could pull it out. Sometimes it was painful, but yet she could still pull it out. She was honest. She was fair. So she's really a dream keeper. Coming from where I came from, you know, I had been dealt a lot of unfair teachers. So he's coming from the rural areas. He's black. He's working class. So most people had low expectations for him, but not Miss Mac. Um, so he's used to unfair teachers. Remember that educational pipeline is leaking and it's like, who did it? You know, teachers play a role in that. Teachers are dangerous because they can be dream wreckers or dream keepers. So he says, I thought they were all like that because he's in high school. But then I saw her and I began to make honor roll in good grades. She could have looked at me as a poor country boy, but she understood so she's like, I see you come from the country. I see that you're poor and that people have low expectations of you. But education is your key. And this is the bar and you're going to rise to it. So they're very demanding, but warm. Okay, that's that criticality. She sees the inequities and she doesn't use that as an excuse not to teach. She uses that to drive her teaching. You're going to succeed and I'm going to help you do that. Okay, so um, this is Big Mama. Um, and I was also very honored to get to know Big Mama. She taught for 50 years um, before she left teaching. And um, I was able to meet her before she passed away. Uh, so Big Mama says, the lessons I tried to stress to my students were that other people in our community had made it, which meant that they could make it. So she's African-American and she dealt with lots and lots of inequities. Um, 
and uh so she was born and raised before desegregation in the 70s so she was already a teacher before desegregation happened in the 70s and the 50s um so i'm talking about the brown decision in 1954 uh, she was already working as a as a teacher, even though Brown was passed in 1954. It didn't actually start to get implemented in the South until the 60s and the 70s. The 70s was really where they started to make it happen. Um, so that was, you know, quite some time after the decision passed. So she's talking about um, her own experiences and then. Um, uh, her students and she knows that they're facing discrimination. She says the lessons that I taught were to show and help my students understand that there was a way out of poverty and out of their circumstances and that education was the way. As black teachers, most of us were really demanding. We didn't just specifically say it per se, but back then you knew that they, all of the black teachers, knew this was the way out of here, these uh, oppressive conditions that education is the key. And it's still the key, right? You have to be know how to be very intentional about what's happening in your world and how you can make a path forward. So it's still the key. Um, it was not okay for my students to come into my classroom without their lessons. I understood that they may have picked cotton all evening the night before, but they still had to get it. And if they did not, there was some sort of punishment. So she's saying, look, I know you have to do these hard things. I know maybe you didn't have electricity last night. Um, maybe you didn't have um, dinner last night. Maybe you were in the cotton field or you had to babysit or you had to go to work, but you still have to find a way. You have to make a way out of no way. You have to bring your homework, make it happen. It's a priority. And so she's acknowledging the inequities that they're facing, but she doesn't use it as an excuse to be like, Ah, oh, bless their hearts. You know, they had to work a long night at McDonald's. And so I won't worry about if their homework's there or not. She's just making a way out of no way. And she's like, I'm, I'm, I care about you and I want you to have a good future. And so I'm demanding and the, the standard is here and I need you to rise to that. And I'm going to help you, but that's my expectation that you're going to rise to that. So do you see how that's criticality where they're addressing that? Um, so you can see here on this chart, we're comparing um, Miss uh, Mac and Big Mama. Okay, now here is, um, these are some uh, black teachers here that um, were teaching before desegregation and then after desegregation. And um, so this teacher here, he says um, that sometimes it was dealing with the uh, criticality wasn't just in his teaching, but also just happened to be in the building. And so he said, um, OK, oftentimes I have to go into the classroom to do damage control. We have these white female teachers, which we know um, that would be me. Right. Um, we know that most of our teaching force in the United States, like over 85% of our teaching force is white women who are primary English speakers who only speak English, they're monolingual Anglophones. And so they often don't have a lot of experience with um, social differences. So this is what he was dealing with too. And he says, um, we have these white female teachers who are af afraid of brothers. So she's talking about, um, or he's talking about black male students, that they're, that these white women teachers are afraid of black male students. And they look for an excuse to kick these brothers out of class. Now, don't get me wrong. These brothers are hard. Um, a lot of them are coming up from Detroit and Chicago to live with their grandparents. This was in um, Mississippi and Alabama. 
I had this one guy who had come down to the South from Detroit and he was hard and he was angry and he was in this teacher's classroom and the two of them had gotten into it over something. And this guy was not even my student. I happened to be in the hallway when she kicked him out of class. And um, now if he got sent to the office, he was gonna be suspended and kicked out of school, which have, would have made him only that much angrier. So, you know, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. It was expected for this brother to get kicked out of school. And um, so I grabbed him and I said, let's go for a walk. Let's grab a Coca-Cola and talk. And this gave him a chance to cool down and hopefully resolve the situation. So I had to give this young brother, I felt like it was my obligation to give this young brother some guidance on how to deal with his anger with years and years of being what he considered to be disrespected at school. And he probably was disrespected at school because that happens constantly with teachers who mean well but are very disrespectful to their students. Okay, especially white teachers teaching black students, they often don't understand how to interact and they do come across as very disrespectful. Um, so he intervened as an exemplary teacher, he intervened there. Um, so he says, yes, teaching students history is important, but something I learned from my own teachers is that mentorship is important. So that kind of relationship, I care about you. I understand that, um, you know, you're facing a lot of discrimination and people have low expectations for you, but I care about you and I'm going to earn your trust and the bar is here and I'm going to help you to get there. Okay. So that is um, definitely about um, principle six. And one one uh, last teacher here in this little education brief, um, this is Mr. Hassan, and he um, he's teaching um, sixth and eighth grade humanities class, and he uses a lot of diverse literature in his class. So um, that would be something that I encourage you to do too. If all of the stories in your classroom are have are white authors and they have white characters and white um, perspectives in it, you know that's why even my son, who um, is Latinx, and he comes home from preschool and trying to wash his brown skin off because he's seen in the stories and the things that they do in the classroom, nobody looks like him. That's criticality where you're addressing that criticality. Um, my son shouldn't come home from school and want to not be brown. He should be able to be brown and successful in school, right? So Mr. Hassan knows that and he's a dealing with that and addressing that. And that's part of his criticality that how he teaches in the classroom. So he uses diverse um, literature in his everyday teaching practices and connects to student rights, human rights, and social justice as they influence the students. Okay, so um, so he said, so though the primary focus of this discussion was on African Americans, attention was frequently extended to other minority groups in the United States and abroad, such as Mexican and Guatemalan immigrants. So this is Mr. Hassan here um, talking to his students. One of the students in his class says, it's not right to judge people by the color of their skin. So Mr. Hassan says, um, well, here are the people around Wasai, uh, that's the student's name, who think that dark skinned people are ugly. And then another student responds, he says, why would they think black is ugly if they are black? The same student replies, that's obnoxious and racist. And then a student, a fourth student enters the conversation. There's a 50 to 75% chance that her mom was also black. Now, Mr. Hassan enters the conversation. Why would her mom, who is black, call her child racist names? 
the first student responds, well, maybe the mother's ashamed of what the people are saying about her child. So Mr. Hassan writes the word ashamed on the whiteboard. And then another student um, uh, comments, I have to object to that. I wouldn't want to be made to be feel bad by my own mom. She's the one that that made her talking about the student. Um, so Mr. Hassan then asks, can't you tell someone uh, when someone doesn't think you're can't you tell when someone doesn't think you're all that great? Let me go back to this issue of being ashamed. Um, and again, he takes the opportunity to dis discuss with his students this concept in in integrally tied to the development of student self-concept. This idea of being ashamed, like this notion that you are you should wash off the brown on your skin, um, is a sense of being ashamed of being that color um, of your group and your family's background. Um, killing butterflies or um, hunting and fishing like Matthew did, um, getting the message that that's the wrong story. Okay, so he's bringing that into the classroom. That's criticality. Um, and so uh, he says, listen very closely to what I'm going to say. Most of the people you named are light complexioned and have very long straight hair. Uh, very few dark-skinned women, most of your choices do not have big noses, and many of them have had surgery on their noses to make them thinner. Most of us think that the lighter you are, the better you are. If you're white, you're all right. If you're brown, stick around. If you're mellow, you're yellow. If you're black, stay back. So that was kind of historically the idea. We should not think that way. And so they discuss that in the classroom. So that is an example of um, criticality um, from Mr. Hassan's um, classroom. Okay, one last um, example that I'd like to share with you, since this is such a, um, often a challenging, um, a challenging, um, principle for for teachers. Um, this is a uh, lesson plan. This is what one teacher used um, this poem where I'm from. And you can kind of uh, see here um, how this teacher is using criticality. Okay. Let me see if I can open that up for you. Okay, now this was written by a high school student. And the, okay, let me just put this back here. I want to um, get her lesson plan as well. Okay, where I'm from lesson plan. So all these things are here for you um, on uh, Canvas. So you can save them and uh, use them. There's lots of wonderful um, resources for you here. So let me open that one as well. Okay, there it is. Okay, all right, I'm just gonna scoot that out of the way. Okay, so there's the student's um, poem, which is, I I have as a second separate document here. Um, this student uh, wrote this where I'm from. I'm from clothespins, from Clorox and um, carbon tetraclide. I am from the dirt under the back porch black glistening it tasted like beets i am from forsythia bush the dutch elm where the long gone limbs i remember as if my own okay so this is a high school student you could also do this i have done this with elementary school students as well 
And so in this article here, Linda Christensen, she's a white teacher, and she actually um, is the one who developed this lesson plan. Okay, um, let me see. So the students actually read that poem together. Okay, so that this is the line poem. So my, my apologize. My apologies. Um, her students did not write this one. This one is the poem, a culturally diverse um, author wrote this poem. She used this in her classroom. And she says that they go line by line through the poem and they notice the details that line remembers about her past. Um, and they talk about that. And then um, they share, notice how she uses, um, they shared their lists out loud. So um, they're not just going from reading the poem to writing their own poem. She's got it scaffolded for them. So she's got guided practice steps in here as well, where um, they're sharing their uh, lists out loud with each other and helping each other with their lists. And um, they probably also wrote a poem together as a whole class in a guided practice before the students were actually uh, writing their own, okay? And so here's her students' um, poems. She's, um, these are her students. I am from bobby pins, from do-rags and wide tooth combs. Um, that sounds like probably an African-American student. I am from prayer plants that lift their stems and rejoice every night. I am from chocolate cakes and deviled eggs, from older cousins and hand-me-downs to shut-ups and sit-downs. Um, so, I mean, this is clearly a lesson that has criticality. Um, so these are older students that have written that. Um, but as I, I mentioned, uh, even younger students can can do this as well. Um, I've had very good luck um, with younger students as well doing this. Um, I, I would love to share you with you uh, one of um, my younger students. These were uh, third grade students. And um, this ended up being so, so uh, fun and um, such a great uh, learning experience. Um, so my students were doing these um, Honey, I Love poems. And so we kind of did that same thing of um, uh, where I'm from. And um, so there's a, a book by a black um, a writer and uh, she wrote the book, Honey, I Love. And so we listened to the book, Honey, I Love and we read it together. And um, then uh, we wrote together our own um, Honey, I Love poems. And so these are just some of them that they wrote. Um, Honey, I Love by C.C. Brown. I love, I love a lot of things, a whole lot of things. I love when my sister takes me to the mall. Honey, let me tell you, I love when I get a lot of things. I also love crawfish, but honey, let me tell you what I don't love when I smell crawfish. Okay, um, so these were just precious. Um, this this one by Rashad, he says, I love to eat a lot of food. I love to eat red velvet cake. I love to eat chips. I love to eat pizza. I love to eat out at old Charlie's restaurant. I love to eat catfish. I love to eat crawfish. I love to eat crabs. I just, just like snow crabs, but I don't like bugs messing with me. And so when the students, um, wrote these, you can see that they're drawing on their own personal experiences. You've got higher order thinking skills because they're not just learning vocabulary words out of context, 
but they're actually creating a poem here and they're using what they saw modeled by um the author who wrote honey i love and like eating red velvet cake that is very much of a southern tradition we have red velvet cake at all holidays and special events um everybody kind of competes to see who makes the best red velvet cake so he's drawing on his background experiences all of these children are um african-american and oh charlie's restaurant is a restaurant that's in our community so see how he's drawing on his own background and we eat a lot of catfish. We're right on the Gulf Coast. You can get catfish and uh, shrimp and crawfish. That comes right out of the Gulf of Mexico. So um, the students are, their own identities are being affirmed there. Uh, so that's principle number two from Labs and Billings, right? High levels of academic achievement, high levels of um of cultural competence. And this is definitely about criticality because um, we're looking at um, how their experiences are often um, left out of the curriculum. And Honey I Love is a wonderful story um, that the students read or we read that book. And you can see that. Um, here a uh, example of of honey i love um this these students that wrote these honey i love poems they uh performed them uh for the community and everybody that was in the audience uh they thought that i wrote those poems for the students they were shocked that um that uh, the students actually wrote them themselves. So here's, this is Rashad right here, and this is Cece, and this is Kaylee. And so um, they actually perform that. And you can see Cece is reading her poem here. So do you see how all the principles are coming together here? Um, here's uh, the the book honey i love by eloise greenfield you can click that link right there well um kaylee was down in alabama for the summer because um her family lives like many families part of the family is in the north and then they have roots of their family in the south and so she had come to spend the summer with um, her grandparents. And so I use that as that's a, a cultural pattern that's historically had a lot of reasons for that where, um, you know, parents were working in the North and then they sent their children down to stay with grandparents. And that's a, a tradition that has happened over the generations for a very long time and it's still happening and so that's like a cultural practice that you see in the african-american community in the south and um, the family tree that's in other parts so that i knew that and i picked up on when kaylee was with us we talked about well where's everybody from um Kaylee goes to school during the school year in Birmingham um and then her uh parents are divorced so she lives part of the year uh in the north in Chicago with her dad I believe is the one who lives in um Chicago and so um so I used the experiences of my students to be able to uh, look at geography. We did math, um, calculating mileage of how long and far it was and how expensive it was to get from Chicago to Mobile. And um, so we looked at all the different aspects of the curriculum um, through the lens of my students' experiences. And here you see 
uh, we were on a field trip and Rashad loves Alabama football. Um, so we use that. Um, but it was definitely um, higher order thinking skills and drawing from the students, a cultural background, um, and that everyone had such a good time performing their poems and people thought that I wrote them, not the children. You can see how proud the students were that that was actually their own works. So you can do stuff like that with, um, you know, older learners as well as with the younger learners. And Rashad wasn't a student who enjoyed a lot of reading and writing. He'd rather do something about football. But if I could connect with him um, and make it about him, I was able to get him to focus on reading and writing a lot more as well as math. So that's a little bit about um, uh, principle six and um, about what that criticality looks like in the classroom. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end this and um, hope you found this very helpful.